Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. Um, I'm going to stand. My voice tends to carry, so I don't think you'll probably be hearing me. Um, you know, I'm particularly thankful uh, to this foundation because research is often a long and windy road, and these projects give you a chance to uh, take a flyer, as I call them, and they're venture grants, which means they allow you to explore new areas of research. And this is very much a new area of research for myself. As someone who particularly takes care of post-transplant patients, um, there's been a historical chasm between us who need organs um, and the community that donates organs or society that donates organs. And there's really been a, a wall between that. And it's only recently, in fact, that um, those of us working on the post-transplant side are starting to do research uh, in terms of strategies to improve uh, or increase the availability of the organs. Um, and so I think this is uh, uh, particularly exciting for our group. Um, these are my disclosures. Uh, they're not relevant for here, but important to include. And as I alluded to, one of the nice things about this is, is it's forcing my research group to branch out. I'm somebody who does clinical trials, both co cohort studies, randomized control trials, and I do big data analysis. And, and then I do uh, uh, primarily research in health services uh, and research ethics. But what I'm branching into here is actually qualitative research methodology. So I'm quite fortunate to work with um, three, three researchers who are uh, very uh, useful to us in uh, getting more than uh, more information than you can get from summary statistics. This is really trying to actually do mixed methods research or uh, research where you survey uh, individuals to actually find out what they're thinking. Um, so it's it's very challenging um, um, and. For me, I've always viewed this as a bit of a black box, um, but it can be quite insightful. So it's, it's, uh, it's been very um, uh, useful from that perspective. And as you'll see, we're working across a multidisciplinary team, so I, I just want to acknowledge my group. So by way of background, we all know, and we can debate this later, but we have an opt-in system in Canada that's well established, and I'm actually quite a strong supporter of opt-in uh, system for organ donation. But we're all also probably familiar with this, that 20%, so about one in five Canadians are registered as organ donors across the country. Um, but then when we do surveys of individuals, 80 to 90% of people say, oh yeah, I support organ donation. So there's this inherent disconnect. And this whole issue of how we change that um, uh, to get people to act on, the back, on something that they inherently support has been a ongoing challenge. And just by way of comparison, in the United States, um, uh, about 55% of the US population is a registered organ donor, which is really quite phenomenal. And in some states, when you look state by state, it's upwards of 85% of their citizens are registered organ donors. So the big issue here um, that we've come around to thinking about is, is, is why would you want to change um, the uh, process of registration from something that is done in a very public form that's disconnected from your health, i.e. the Department of Motor Vehicles, to a healthcare uh, realm. And some of these, I think, are really actually realities of the fact that the field is changing. Uh, and the first is, is, is that the practice of organ donation is actually rapidly evolving. Um, and what I mean by this is, is there's increased use of pre-donation interventions in the donors. So these are deceased individuals, people who've either met criteria for neurological brain death or not in the case of uh, circulatory death uh, donors, but to improve organ quality. And this is definitely a very active area of research. Uh, and the reason we want to do this obviously is to expand uh, the availability of organs. So many organs um, unfortunately are not suitable to be transplanted. And so to improve the quality or, or performance of those organs, but also in terms of increasing access um, uh, to these organs for people. So there are limitations in terms of shipping organs and moving them. And so, you know, one of the realities of, of, of transplantation, certainly in North America, we've got big geogra geographic differences, is there are inequities that relate to. So uh, improving this is an important aspect of this. Um, so this is, this is changing in terms of uh, what we do. Um, I'm going to show you some really important things that when we think about donor research and how we do that, um, the issue, there's multiple complex issues there, and I'm going to talk about that, about this, but there's definitely increased interest in, in, in organ donor research, and that has implications for people who are contemplating being organ donors, right? And so you need to understand that um, there's things that could be done to your body before your organs are actually removed, and, and how we get to informing people about that um, so that they can make well-informed decisions about organ donation is something that we need to increasingly discuss. 
As you know, there is now do donation after circulatory or cardiac death donors. These are people who don't uh, meet um, uh, criteria for neurological brain death, but there's been a decision to withdraw care. The ongoing care is futile, their family accepts that. Uh, and then after that, there's a process uh, with which that uh, they can donate their organs. We also now have medically assisted uh, uh, death donors uh, in this province and in Canada. And so the points of bringing all this up is, is the considerations that a person may uh, uh, experience when they think about being organ donors are expanding and there's more considerations from a health perspective than there have been in the past. There's other issues. We know that sometimes when people register, their family refuses. Um, and so making sure that that decision is well informed uh, and so that everybody is comfortable with the person's wishes is an important aspect and increasingly important. In BC, as you know, we have the opportunity uh, when we ask individuals to register a decision, it's not just saying, yes, I'd like to be an organ donor. You also have the ability to say, no, I don't want to be an organ donor. And one of the major issues, and, and I hope we do get to talk about opting in and opting out, is the education piece that needs to go there. So if an uninformed patient, go, a person goes to the DMV and knows nothing about organ donation, and may have some trepidation about it, and they're just asked the question. In fact, we know, um, uh, uh, and I'm not a, a, a we're gonna, this is something that we're gonna expand and look at, is, is that people often take the path of least resistance, which is to say no. And so this is one of the reasons why we think the, uh, the process of, of making sure that someone is making a well-informed decision about organ donation perhaps needs to move from the sort of very common, uh, low-level interaction that you might have at the Department of Motor Vehicles to something that is much more of a healthcare decision. And that's the, the crux of, of where we're coming from with this research. So we, I hope you guys think that that's forward thinking. Now, what do we know about why people do and don't register? Well, this is sort of the traditional list. Um, people may have positive or negative attitudes about donation. And this can be formed by very fleeting interactions, things they see on movies, you know, the soap opera where somebody woke up after, you know, 11 months in a coma or something like that. So there's about those things. Their knowledge about donation may be limited or very strong, and that may influence their ability to, their, their want to register. And then they have uh, cultural, religious beliefs or, or feelings of altruism. <coughs> On the other side, excuse me, I put this into sort of the irac uh, irrational or silly, but these are true for the individuals that are contemplating this. There's the ick factor, right? Oh my gosh, something's gonna happen to me. There's the jinx factor. If I sign up for this, maybe I'm, 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 I'm perpetuating my own demise. There's tr medical mistrust and in a pluralistic society, this is something that we have to be very concerned about. And then there's concerns about body integrity um, uh, and, and the afterlife. And so these are real concerns for individuals. So again, it speaks to the issue of, of we're just asking that at a very low level in the DMD, is that gonna work as we go forward and as organ donation becomes more complicated? And this is in fact now recognized at very high levels. So this concept of consent for organ donation is actually a bit of a misnomer. In BC's legislation, uh, we use the term consent, um, but you'll see here there's many terms that are actually used for the consent process. So everything from consent, a register as a donor, agree to donate, and what does that all mean? The term consent usually implies adherence to principles of informed medical consent. And I would argue that when you register at the DMV, well, we'll come to that, but that's not necessarily achieved. And this is recognized that for the purposes of organ donation, there's implicit acknowledgement that consent in this form is impossible or difficult to achieve in many scenarios due to loss of capacity. But importantly, in the context of registration, there's differing levels of consent that are expressed earlier in life, right? So I may tell my spouse, yeah, I'd like to be an organ donor. What does that actually mean when it comes to the point where my, where my spouse may have to decide whether I'm going to be an organ donor? And so that's a chiasm that is, is recognized. And so many regions actually use the term authorization to distinguish the fact that the, the decision-making process that an individual may have had may not meet the criteria for consent. So if we think about you know, the optimal information that someone ought to know if they're making a decision about consenting for organ donation, I would put all of these things on the list. A description of what the process involves. And again, in all the scenarios that we talked about, there could be research that's done to your body. You could be in a situation where you don't meet criteria for brain death. All these things are not necessarily explained to somebody when you register as an organ donor. A discussion of the benefits of donation and the potential to help each other. We have that sort of lowbrow thing when you go to sign up your driver's license that one donor can help eight individuals and many tissue donors. But what does that really mean for people? What does it actually mean? How many organs are discarded and so forth? 
And people need to know the realistic side of this because donors are disappointed when their organs are not transplanted or not usable. And so we need to be more transparent about that process. Reassurance regarding funeral and burial arrangements is an important consideration. And reassurances about the fairness of organ allocation are important concepts that I would put on my list that if I was signing up and wasn't in the business of transplantation, that I would want to know if I was considering it. Um, and so I would argue that these elements are not necessarily fulfilled at the DMV. Now, this issue of research in organ donation is actually recognized in this document, and I encourage you to look at it. It's the nat at the very bottom here, you can see it's the National uh, Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. This used to be called the Institutes of Medicine. They've rebranded themselves. And basically, uh, what happens in the United States is when there's something controversial where there isn't high-level information, you get some erudite people together in a room and they lay out the lay of the land. And this is, in fact, what the Institute of Medicine does for a high cost. And so I'm on the board of directors of the American Society of Transplantation. We were one of the sponsors of this work, which really addresses this moving field where we are now moving to a realm of doing research in individuals prior to their demise to improve the quality of their organs. So nothing to benefit themselves, but really to benefit uh, uh, people who will be receiving these organs. And I just want to highlight, without going into too much detail here, but one of their key objectives here was to clarify legal guidance on organ donation for the purposes of research, followed by transplantation. And really what they're talking about here is organ donation intervention research. And in fact, this issue needs to come up in Canada, and it's one of the things that we're going to tackle. You'll see that here, goal number three, they, they recommended clarifying legal guidance on organ donation for the purposes of research, followed by transplantation. And the two major things that they're recommending is, is that there needs to be a public consultation and consideration of, of changing the law in the United States called the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act to include considerations of research. So when a descendant has stated a general intent to make an anatomical gift without further specification, research followed by transplantation is permitted. So what they're saying is, is, is that they want to change the law to make that implicit so that people, when they sign up to be an organ donor, that they understand that that includes the potential for research on their body, which is an important difference. And similarly for their families, they're saying the same thing needs to be considered. And so this has not happened in the United States, but this is a recommendation that this consultation needs to take. And all of this again is background to saying that I would argue that 20 years from now, we won't be asking people to consent uh, for organ donation at the DMV. It will be integrated as part of, our, uh, as part of a health decision uh, where I think it appropriately belongs. So this was sort of the background to this work, and so our research hypothesis, and you'll see that it's morphed over time, is to provide opportunities for patients to obtain information, ask questions, and discuss organ donation while they're in the hospital, um, and to see whether this will increase uh, 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 donor registration. So we think that this is, uh, is, a, is a reasonable hypothesis. These were the specific aims as part of this grant. You can see that they were quite modest. The first was to determine patient support for integrating uh, this process um, uh, to get information about organ donation and to have an opportunity to register as an organ donor while they're in hospital. And importantly, we're interested in a few different areas. Inpatients, so people who are actually in the hospital. Outpatients, people who are coming for a radiology procedure or an outpatient clinic visit um, or emergency room uh, encounters. And then in addition to that, we wanted to talk to people who were in charge of those various areas to see, did this really bugger up your life to have this process being integrated? And what were your concerns about trying to integrate this? You can imagine that the charge nurse in the emergency department isn't necessarily going to be loving this, this process. Um, and then to identify implementation challenges. So that's what the, the, the goals of this project were. And here was our work plan. The first thing was to say, well, what's been done? Um, what's out there? I mean, you may think you're the only person that has that the idea, but usually that's not the case. And so we wanted to look at studies examining organ donation in the healthcare setting. Uh, and then we recognize the importance that this is really a little bit about implementation science. And so to do that in this day and age, you need a team. It takes a village to change things. So the first thing we thought was important is, is we had to engage our hospital leadership. Uh, and so I'll tell you about that. And then we needed to survey healthcare leaders in these different areas of the hospital that we potentially wanted to touch patients, and then to survey patients, and then to test a strategy, and then if it worked, to refine, revise, and disseminate it. And so that's our work plan. And we haven't finished all of this, but I'll show you where we've gotten to. 
Um, so starting with the systemic uh, literature review, and I haven't provided you uh, research here, but just to give you a sense of, of, of this has been thought about primarily in the primary care setting. So it's been thought about in family physicians' offices, and there's been multiple small studies and some significant studies actually that have been done in family physicians' offices. And the first thing is, is that in general, family physicians, like all physicians, are never going to say, yeah, no, I'm not supportive of organ donation. They all say, yeah, we're, we're, we're keen. This, we think this is part of what we should be doing, which is educating patients about um, end-of-life decisions, including organ donation. Um, so they believe it's within the scope of their work, but the major challenge here is they lack time. So that's a consistent theme. I'm summarizing some, some, some bottom-line sentences from many studies in that sense. The second thing is, 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 well, what's been done in terms of these family physician interactions? They're what I call waiting room interventions. That's a term that I just made up to sort of summarize this literature. But overall, I would say that these things have limited impact. So putting a brochure in your doctor's office or having a poster up or those kinds of things are really low impact. And you can see that I've summarized a bunch of studies. So these are 59,000 um, without that, and then they can go up to double that. Well, big deal. It's not a huge uh, splash in terms of doing that. So those kinds of things may be important so that people can have access to those things, but they don't change the world, okay? Um, and then if you add a physician interaction, so in addition to having a pamphlet or a poster or something like that, if you actually engage the, the, the people who are running the office and said, could you answer one or two questions, that did increase things. Some studies show no <coughs> increase, but up to a 5% increase. So overall, this looks like something that although it sounds good and it seems probably uh, well-intentioned and so forth, it's difficult to implement and the splash that you're gonna get from this is not massive. We're not causing a typhoon here of, of increased registrations. Um, another important aspect related to this is that most of the emphasis has been on the intervention rather than the content of what's provided to people. And I should make you aware of this trial that's currently going on in Ontario. It's in primary care physicians in six offices in southern Ontario. And they're really trying to use behavioral change therapy, which I would argue I don't want to do. I want people to make well-informed decisions, and I don't care whether they register or not. I want them to have all the information to make an informed choice. So I actually don't love this area of research. That's just me. I'm a controversial guy, and I'm, I say things that others don't like. But they're really looking at how you can capitalize on, patient, uh, on people's impulses um, and, and their spontaneous decisions. So they're really looking at trying to change behavior with different scenarios and present some of those ick factor type scenarios and get people to say, oh yeah, well I'm gonna sign up as an organ donor because that's not me. That's some of what they're trying to do with this. Um, and so that study is actually ongoing. And so it's, it's really focusing on strategies to get people to say yes. I don't wanna do that. I, wanna, I want people to really think about this and contemplate this and, and make informed decisions. So there's a, a, a difference in how I view things. Now the second part of our work plan was to engage with hospital leadership. And one of the things that you have to be aware of is, as, an, as I said, this is community uh, sort of change. And you have to be aware of other major things that are being invested in and that people have put lots of energy in, particularly in our government. And this is one of them, which is uh, the advancement of advanced care directives. And this is a major challenge. And all of our thought leaders at St. Paul's who are on our board uh, always came back to this, is that if you can find a way to integrate this into the work that we're already doing with regards to advanced care planning, and it's now province-wide, as many of you probably know, that would be a good thing. So that was a strong, uh, I would say, the strongest uh, uh, thing that we hadn't really thought about when we started this, uh, this project. Um, we surveyed healthcare leaders in different areas of the hospital. And these were semi-structured interviews where we would sit down, it wasn't me, it was a research associate, because people are gonna say different things to me uh, than they're gonna say to my research associate. And so we interviewed uh, people who led the emergency department, radiology, the, the GI outpatient clinics, um, um, uh, uh, inpatient uh, services on the medical and surgical side, and we talked to people in volunteer services, and we talked to critical care leaders. Um, and the first thing is, 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 is when you do these interviews, uh, there's a big social desirability bias, right? No one's gonna say, yeah, I get what you're trying to do, but I really don't want you in my department. There's no question there is an undertone of this. And so people were um, uh, um, generally supportive, but there clearly were challenges with regards to this. So there is a social desirability bias that we recognize in the answers that they gave us. Um, and they had important questions and concerns, I would say questions, not mad concerns, about feasibility and the impact on their ability to do what they normally care about doing. 
And so there are challenges with doing this, and it, and it varied depending upon the department that you were, you were talking about. Um, the next thing we did is, is we actually in, um, did surveys, and these were patients who were not admitted. These are ambulatory patients. These are patients who are coming into the hospital for a variety of different things, everything from radiology to um, uh, mostly patients who were doing day appointments or, or outpatient clinic visits. And so the first thing that we asked them is, would you be willing to receive uh, information about organ donation while you're here in the hospital? Uh, and the answer was, was generally yes, 42%. Um, but some of them said, yeah, but you know, I got a lot on my mind right now. I'd love it if you followed up with me at a different time point. And some of them said no. So it was a bit of a mixed bag, definitely not a slam, slam dunk. And I think it's probably reflects reality, right? When you're there uh, for another appointment, your mind isn't necessarily attuned to be thinking about this other thing, let alone a pretty serious thing. If yes, how would you like to receive your information? Some of them just wanted written information. Um, others of them really welcome the opportunity to, to, to get some uh, uh, questions answered by an, ex, uh, an expert. So that would imply a significant investment uh, for us to be able to do that, to have somebody available. You can imagine if someone's waiting around for their CT scan uh, that they've come into, you want to you know, <laughs> have quite a bit of service. So that points some reality in there. And would you like the opportunity to register while you're actually here? And this would be like on a tablet, like on an iPad or something like this. And you can see that uh, people were unsure. So overall, I would consider this general support for this, but again, not a slam dunk, right? We're not landing a big fish here um, unnecessarily. So you can see that there's a disconnect between reality and, and what we can say, even in that small sample size, you can see that. When we come to a hospitalized patients, so these are people who are actually in hospital, uh, we found significant challenges. So when we talked to nursing leadership on the general surgical services and on the inpatient medical services, the overwhelming theme that came up time and time again, yes, but it's a good idea, but um, our patients are sick, our patients are complicated, they, they, they have stuff going on. So maybe timing isn't right. Um, and so I think that was the major theme. And for this reason, we didn't go ahead with actually surveying people who were admitted to hospital. So we decided not to do that. Um, so what did we end up doing? We actually changed things, and, and this is again a, a windy path that you're allowed to do here. And we, you can see we're not focusing actually on patients now, we're talking to family members of patients who were admitted to critical care. And this came about, in fact, in consultations with some of our, doctor, uh, some of our doctors in the critical care areas, but also some of the nursing staff in the critical care areas. And the reflection was, was that um, uh, when, patients have, when individuals have gone through uh, a life-threatening illness with somebody that they care about, it's natural for them to think about their own um, uh, uh, health and what they would have, what they would want to have happening. The same thing. It's a natural thing. Everybody goes through that. If anybody's had someone seriously ill, you can that resonates with you. And so this was something that we thought was very interesting. So the experience of a life-threatening illness is a time for self-reflection about one's own life plans. And so we got this. Um, and in addition to this, our people who are working in the critical care area are highly invested in implementing advanced care planning, which was again a directive that we've gotten from our hospital leadership. And they were also interested in improving the family experience for people who have to come into the CCU or the ICU when a family member is sick. It's a daunting thing, and so they're highly interested in trying to make that experience better. So we thought this was a significant opportunity to engage uh, with family members uh, in this. So which families are we looking at? So we're looking at families of people who survived the critical care survival again. So, and the idea here is, is, is that patients, when they leave a critical care area, we'll get to that in a second, are usually in some sort of step down thing. They get convalescence on a general medical ward where they're just really, the acuity of the thing is passed. And now we're trying to get them strong enough to get out of hospital. And that's when we want to interact with their families. So come up in the next thing. The other program we're working with is, is actually a very high profile program at St. Paul's and this is um, the Extracorporal uh, Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation or ECPR program. This is led by Brian Grun, who's a Merge uh, doctor along with Anson Chung. And what we're doing is, is these are people who failed conventional CPR. And what happens is, is if they're young and have otherwise few comorbidities, they're brought to St. Paul's Hospital and they're crashed onto uh, ECMO. Um, which is extracorporeal membrane audit. Basically, it's a heart lung machine. And the idea there is, is to continue the resuscitative efforts beyond which you would normally see some of those, those individuals would die. Um, and importantly about that, 
the reason that that's important is the, the, the so-called save rate or survival rate in that program is actually very low. It's about 15 to 20 percent of individuals may survive that. But typically these are young people whose family has gone through a very traumatic thing. So we're talking about very high risk um, uh, sort of uh, uh, or, or vulnerable populations in terms of engaging in this conversation. So what are we doing um, with, the, uh, with the people, the families of survivors of ICU? Um, they are given information about the study now. So the families are made aware that we're doing the study and we are asking for permission for our research coordinator to go talk to the family while they're visiting with that individual in a convalescent setting. So the critical care admission has, has, has finished. They're now in a general medical ward typically, and that's where that interaction will take. And there, we're, this work is not completed yet. We're doing qualitative interviews um, uh, with either the family as a whole or individual family members. And this is done by a research associate. The second thing in those ECPR families, again, most of those patients have died. Um, and so we're, we, we've received support from our REV to contact those families and ask them about uh, the outcome of organ donation. So the reason this is such a critical thing is this ECPR program is highly resource intensive. And one of the outcomes, I'm a, I, I do health economics research as well, uh, one of the outcomes for the future of this program actually depends not just on the survival of the patients, but also the potential for organ donation. So you can imagine if we're going to do this uh, for people who have out of hospital cardiac arrests, the economics of this, the reality is, is, is if we're investing those kinds of resources, we do have to understand the potential for organ donation in that setting. So this is particularly, uh, um, this will be a small study because there's only been about 15 families um, uh, that we have uh, contact with, but they've agreed to provide their um, uh, feedback with regards to whether what they would think if their loved one, remember this is all very emergent in someone who's had a, a cardiac arrest, whether they would accept the outcome of organ donation in that setting. So it's quite delicate research, but we think it's, it's something and the families are receptive. And so that's where, you know, uh, this is a, a for me, a, a really interesting uh, piece. It's definitely stretching the kind of things I do. So to quickly summarize in the ambulatory setting, we think this is a nice thing, but we think it's mostly a motherhood thing. Yes, you want it there, you want pamphlets there, you want information there. Is it gonna change the world? Maybe not, um, but we need to consider continue to grow that. And so that's something that needs to be pursued. For patients that are admitted um, and you know are in pneumonia or medical or surgical issues, um, the issue of timing is a really important one. So what we're thinking of is, is, is what is the post-hospital discharge interaction with those patients look like so that they we can come around to discussing these issues. Um, and we haven't given up on um, uh, trying to integrate this as part of advanced care planning. And then the research that I hope um, has intrigued you is, is, is really sort of vulnerable families. And the idea here is is, 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 is people are serious now about thinking about what would happen to themselves. And so we're trying to work on, on that area and I think that will be particularly exciting. Um, some important limitations, St. Paul's Hospital is a unique hospital. If you've been there, uh, the patient populations are different than they would be in uh, White Water Hospital, right? They're different, the patients are different, medical conditions are different, and so the environment is different. And so some of our learnings in St. Paul's might not be directly transplantable, uh, uh, transplantable, transferable <laughs> <laughs> to another setting. It's an important consideration, but that's where I work, and so that's what this, this work is done. So um, uh, I do have a CHR Foundation grant, and so some of this work actually informed that, and really um, the parts that we hope to take uh, forward is to complete the work in the families that are admitted to critical care, uh, to investigate the issues in persons uh, registering as non-donors in BC. And so we've had some discussions uh, with Sean Keenan, and I, I see Leanne's here um, uh, from BC Transplant. There's an interest in understanding this, and so the question is, is, is what educational piece could you bring to the DMV to improve the uh, information that patients would, persons would receive before they made the, 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 the decision. So we're interested in doing that and that will, would flow within the context of these foundation grants. These are just basically big grants for old guys like me that says you don't need to write a grant every year and you can sit around and think about how you want to do stuff. And then finally, uh, we are interested in examining legislation in DC regarding research and donors. As I alluded to, um, the playing surface in the US has been set. I work with a guy named Tim Cofield, who's a health law professor at the University of Alberta, and we're interested in pursuing um, the legislative pieces for this. So I hope you can see that this is a project that starts, it started in 2015 for us, 
It takes a lot of engagement. We have to talk to hospital people. They're not necessarily keen to talk to us right off the get-go. I may have a 12-month agenda, but they don't. Um, and so all this stuff takes time, but it's a really, for me, it's been a, a, a really great opportunity to explore a different area of research where it, I, I really call it the, the science of implementation of how to change things. And changing things and how we do things in hospital settings is not easy, and I've definitely been humbled by this experience. So thank you very much for your time.